Hello lovely people and welcome to Wonky Wednesday. Um, I decided to make this video sitting at my kitchen table for a change because it was lovely and sunny but while I've been messing about setting up the sun's gone so I hope the light's okay. Um, I didn't want to move everything back again. I'll just have a look. I think it's okay. Um, and also some of you were asking after Fred Fred and he was laying here on the table all the time I was setting up so I thought oh that's good he'll be in the video and you know that'll make some of you happy at least but he's um, buzzed off outside so <laughs> sorry about that he might come back um, anyway this week we're going to make hexagons from a circle and this was a suggestion from lovely Trudy who sent me a message and I'd actually seen it years ago I was teaching a workshop and a lady had a little um, bag or fabric box on her desk to put her orts and things in um, and it had these on it and so I asked her and she quickly showed me how it was done. Anyway I couldn't exactly remember to be honest so I did have to do a bit of fiddling about um, but I've worked it out finally. Um, so what you will need are some scraps of cloth and you can do so totally do this scrappy. I've used two different, I'm going to do a granny's flower garden motif so I've just chosen two different colours and a red for the middle. Um, you need something to make a circle template or just something to draw around. You could literally just draw around. I used a tin of sweet corn. I could have just drawn around the tin of sweet corn onto my fabric but I made myself a little cardboard template and then I shall just keep that in my template drawer. Um, it's always, you know, you never know when you'll need um, a circle. In terms of finish size, my circle is um, two and a half inches, a good two and a half inches across and my hexagons are from point to point they're about one and a half inches and the sides measure if this is important to you at all about three quarters of an inch um, but I would say you know <laughs> I would say I, I can't work out the maths hexagons are too complicated but anyway just to give you guidance my circle was two and a half inches and I've ended up with these little tinies with three quarter inch sides um, so how do you do it well first of all you cut out however many circles you need and I would say choose some cotton cloth ideally you want something not too thick because they end up you know quite several layers and something that creases nicely so I'm going to show you this last one. Oh, and the other thing I've got is I'm going to stitch it onto this little background piece, um, which is a piece of onion skin dyed silk noil. And on the back is a bit of old sheet just to make it, you know, nice to stitch to. And a needle and thread. I'm just going to use one strand of embroidery floss. Oh, and some buttons. I forgot about the buttons. I've sewn little pearl buttons to the middle. Look at this jar of loveliness that Vicky sent me little pearl buttons do you see them um, but you know any kind of button or a bead or something because you will get visible stitching in the middle um, you can obviously choose whether you want them folded side up or other side up if I was going to have it that side up I would have sewn the button I wouldn't have sewn a button on at all I'd have sewn a button on this side <laughs> and then the stitches would be on that side but if you want both sides visible obviously you just have to be a bit neater with your button stitching I haven't bothered because I'm going to sew it down Anyway, Catherine, stop wittering and make one. So here's a circle that I've cut out using my template as neatly as I can, as long as it's somewhat circular. If the edges are a bit raggedy, it doesn't matter because they'll all get folded in. But for the hexagons to be more or less the right size, it needs to be, you know, accurate-ish. And then you need to find the centre. So the easiest way is to fold it in half. I hope you can see against this bit of white paper because my quilt's a bit colourful and crease, put a crease and open it up and turn it through 90 degrees and fold it in half again and then if you match up those two the crease lines on opposite sides you'll know you're on the exact you know quarter and then crease that and then you, that's probably good enough for you to see but I'm going to put a little pencil cross in the middle you know when you're doing it yourself and I'm going to put a pencil cross just for the purposes of the video. So that's where those two lines meet is my centre. So now I've got my needle and thread and I've got a knot in the end. And now you want to come up anywhere on the perimeter of the circle. It doesn't matter where. From the inside to the outside and about an eighth of an inch from the edge. 
just go straight through till your knot hits the edge and then you want to fold that in so that edge I'll bring you up a bit closer while I'm doing this fiddly bit so that edge touches the center where I've marked the X do you see that and then you crease that fold that you've made and then you turn and you could go the other way but you know I'm just going this way I just keep going the same way and then you go through again into this point that you've made here again about an eighth of an inch from the edge just right through both layers and pull your thread up and as you pull it up and fold that in you want that point also to touch that center do you see do you see and then when you're sure you've got it right then you can just snug your thread up and then crease that that next fold and then you turn and then you do the next one in exactly the same way I hope I'm in frame and you can see from front to back through that point snug it up and then as it folds in just make sure that it comes to the center and then crease it and again you're going to have to do this six times because obviously it's a hexagon so it's got six sides and as you go along it gets you know you're covering up your drawn cross so then you just have to make sure that it meets all the others in the middle and you want to be you don't want to be too far away from the edge because it makes your stitches bigger so an eighth of an inch is just about right it's just enough to bite the fabric you know strongly enough so that the stitch doesn't pull through um, but not so much that you get huge big stitches in the middle and then when you get to the last one you should have a point do you see the point but whatever and you can fiddle about if it's not exactly pointy but make sure that this raw edge here doesn't stick out here otherwise it will show on the other side so when you've got the point you just go through the point again about an eighth of an inch don't get your thread caught around there and then let that point fold in and let that point come exactly to the center or you know we're wonky Wednesday as exactly as you can you just want the sides to be somewhat the same length so that when you come to join them together they, they fit but it's cloth so there's always a bit of give and there we go so I've now got a hexagon so I can use this same thread to sew my button on but before I do I'm going to go just take one stitch through this top layer now here if you want it to be double sided whatever it is you're making if you're not going to cover the back just make sure that you don't go through to the back because now, now or the other side so now do you see I've got a nice clean other side with no no stitch marks in it so if the, you wanted to use these for an English paper piecing project um, you could just you know stop there finish your thread off make hundreds sew them together and make yourself a quilt um, and you know it's just a different way of doing it you'll then of course have the extra bulk but you could then either leave it unbacked or just put a backing and no wadding which English paper piece quilts traditionally didn't have wadding in and and you don't need wadding you know because you've got the extra layer of cloth obviously it does use more cloth anyway I'm going to put a button on um, for which I need a button I want that one because I've been using ones with four holes so I'm going to just line it up somewhat centrally and um, before I go any further once I've done that see I'm just going to shoot right through because I, I'm hiding the back but otherwise you'd have to try and keep your button sewing on thread just in the top layers uh, now before I go any further and start joining them together and chatting and wittering and you know whatever I'm going to go and have a look at what I've just recorded to make sure it was clear because I don't want to join all these together I suppose I could always just show you another one so 
so I'm going to go and do that and then I'm going to come back and um, join them together But because that's pretty much it so I could just stop there but then you'd all be sad because that's only 11 minutes not even <laughs> so I won't do that <laughs> But thank you so much, Trudy, uh, for reminding me of it. I don't think I've ever done it before. I just remembered that lady in that workshop having this little... I was always admiring ladies' little, you know, things that they've made when they came on my workshops. Um, so anyway, enough of that. I'm going to go and check the video. <laughs> and then I'll be back for the next bit. OK, so I checked the video and I think it was OK, so <laughs> I can go on. Um, just another note, while I was talking about the size of the hexagon, um, another thing that I realised is that the diameter of the circle, which if you remember was two and a half inches, is twice the width of a hexagon from straight edge to straight edge. So you see from straight side to straight side there it's one and a quarter inches. So half the diameter of the circle, if that helps you, if you, you know, if you're trying to work it out. So all I'm going to do now, so what I've done is I've sewn the buttons onto the foldy side of my outer ones and um, I haven't sewn a button on my middle one. I'm going to put my middle one other side up and um, maybe I'll put them on here. They get a bit lost in that. Now the other thing you'll notice because of the way the folds go, uh, let's show you on this one, Fred Fred hair. The other thing you'll notice is that you see how the folds are all going in the same direction this way but then when you get back to here which was the beginning one the folds are going opposite ways. Now this might not matter to everybody but it seems to matter to me. Do you see what I mean? So here you've got this triangle's got folds going into it both sides whereas everywhere else they're going so anyway because that matters to me I'm going to make sure that that triangle this section goes towards the middle on every one so that you know I don't know it kind of makes a little star then it, I mean it's not very very visible but once I'd seen it I couldn't unsee it so if that matters to you just be aware of that so I'm going to lay them out so that that little triangle goes towards the middle and I'm just going to whip stitch them together as if I was English paper piecing I'm going to use this same one strand of embroidery floss um, Fred Fred still hasn't come back making sure I'm still in the middle. So I'm just going to leave them laid out, pick them up and put them... I'm going to stitch from the right side, I think, and um, hide my knot somewhere. Oh, Fred Fred hair everywhere. He likes to lay on this table because there's a lovely quilt on it and especially um, in the morning if it's sunny, the sun's on here. I might trim that tail a bit. That is very hairy and it's probably a bit misguided of me to sit here but it just looks so inviting. Anyway, I'll be very interested to hear what you think. I'm not saying I'll do it every time but, you know, just for a change. So I'm just going to whip stitch and you could of course whip stitch with them right sides together but I just felt like having the stitching a bit more visible. And yet again, it's another little project that lends itself to just being an on-the-go project, you know, if you pre-cut some circles and all you need is your little circles and a needle and thread and a little pair of scissors. And you can do it anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Just make them. They're also cute just to use as little elements to um, applique it onto other work of course, they don't have to all be joined to each other. I think they're super cute. Thank you Trudy. So yeah, I'm still taking ideas, not because I haven't got any of my own, <laughs> I hasten to add, because I have, but you know, it's nice when 
someone comes up with something you know that I maybe wouldn't have thought of. So I'm just checking that I've got that triangle thing. <laughs> Apparently it really bugs me. And I'm going to just join them all to the middle and then come back and join the sides I think. If you don't know how to do English paper piecing this would normally be done with a hexagon that you'd basted onto a paper template and then when you'd surrounded the hexagon you'd take the paper template out. We did that in one of the weeks um, in the weekly slow stitch. I can't remember which week it was, it was fairly early on but it was called, um, I think I called it Hidden Histories Untold Stories or something like that because it was inspired by a book that I had from the Victorian Albert Museum showing some of the hexagon quilts in their collection. It's, um, yeah, I think this is, I think I've when I first started doing patchwork I just sewed random scraps together, any old how. Oh, a dark one, I'm just alternating them, make sure my triangle's to the middle. Um, but very quickly I learnt about English paper piecing so it was the real, the, the first real proper patchwork that I did. This thread's getting a bit short. Oopsie. I should change thread really but you know. We all do it, don't we? Tell me we all do it. We all try and eke out the thread as much as we can. One, not to waste thread, but two, because we don't want to stop and re-thread the needle, even though we know we're going to have to in a minute. I don't think I'm going to get all the way around with this bit of thread. So if your hexagons weren't matching up at this point, you can just make them, <laughs> just make them behave. Be the boss of them. I hear people talking because it's such a lovely day. I can hear someone cutting their grass in November. Mine needs cutting again. It hasn't stopped growing yet. Do you see there? There's quite a big gap between those, but when I come to sew that side up, it'll be all right. Uh, so people are out and about because it's nice weather. But I quite like, I like to, you know, I like to hear people chatting and know that if I went out myself for any reason there'd be people to chat to. Everybody's very friendly. Oh I must tell you about Stella and her little friend Robin. Now way back when I was coming, well way back, two, two or three months ago when I was coming here to my new home every day to decorate when I was staying with my friend, I met this chap who, who lives here, who's in his 90s, he's incredible. Um, and his little dog Robin, who's a little chihuahua. And I just thought when I met Robin that he and, St I mean Stella wasn't here yet, Stella was still in France. But I just thought that Robin and she would, would click, I just had a feeling. And they have, they're, they're big, big friends. Although Robin's quite, quite old and, and much quieter than Stella is. Um, I'm just going to hide this end somewhere in a fold, in a handy fold. And yeah, and it was um, love at first sight. But not only Robin, John, Robin's Robin's um, owner, the chap called John, he always has biscuits. I'm just trying to get my thread in the fold and no, I can't, it keeps coming through. Don't do that. He always has biscuits about his person. Um, and Stella knows this. In fact, there's quite a few people around on, on this park that have bis dog biscuits about their persons. And Stella knows exactly who's who. There's my tail now, let's get rid of that. You know, who's got biscuits. <laughs> but anyway, the other day we were walking in the in the woods here just on the, the sort of nearby bit, you know, there's a, a nice bit with sort of gravelly paths and it's nice to walk there, especially when it's wet. 
because you don't get all muddy. And we were walking there and Stella suddenly went racing off round the corner and out of sight and she doesn't usually do that unless there's a squirrel and I called her and she didn't come back and I thought oh no she's you know on the trail of a squirrel but as I rounded the corner I saw in the distance <laughs> was John <laughs> and Stella sat at his feet looking up at him and um, yeah so she'd spotted him <laughs> cupboard love they call that don't they and I'm racing up for a biscuit I'm going to hide my knot in that fold as well. I can probably also hear the fridge kicking in. Because it's not that far away from me. If you've watched Park Home Life, you will know the geography of my kitchen. So again, I want my triangle to the middle. See, that is a complete discrepancy in size. I'm just going to make it fit. So I'm going to start with this point. And that's just accuracy of folding, you know. It's I don't think it is as accurate as doing the paper template thing. But I'm just going to then make those two points match. And you see that darker cotton has um, got a little bump in it. And I'm just going to ease that in. and hope for the best. And now it's fine. Yeah, so yeah, there's there's another lady who walks past here at the back. Stella's out in the garden, she suddenly runs to the gate and sits. And I know that's because that lady's coming who gives her a biscuit. And I've got to put my last one. My triangle. And the last one's a bit fiddlier because I've got the flippy floppies both sides. It was such a lovely day today, I did think about driving to the beach, but... Um, it's quite late by the time I got going this morning. Well, you know, I was up early, but I was doing stuff, faffing about, getting stuff together ready for Friday's journaling video and reading your lovely messages from Monday's video and all that kind of thing. And by the time I'd done all that, it was half past ten. I thought, well, I still have to make Wonky Wednesday because for me it's Tuesday, as you know, I make them the day before so that they can go up in the morning. Um, so now the clocks have gone back, the afternoons seem a lot shorter don't they? It seems to be, you know, after lunch it's not long before it's dark here in the, well in Britain, I don't know how it is in other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Because on the other, on the Southern Hemisphere you're going into um, spring aren't you? You're going into spring? You know, you're going into summer, you've had spring. Right, so I'm going to now, not not um, break my thread, but sew this side up while I'm here. Again, making it match, if it doesn't. See, I just fancied having this stitching visible. I'll show you the back when I'm done so you can decide yourself whether you want to have the stitching. I don't know if you can hear that scraping noise, that's the chap who looks after all the communal areas of the site, you know, he cuts the communal grass and so on. Anyway, he's scraping the weeds that are growing, I think, between the curb and the, and the lane. Right outside my front window. <laughs> he's a character. He's still wearing shorts. Although it's, well, it's probably nice now out in the sun. But yes, apparently we know when winter's really here when he puts his long trousers on because he just likes to wear shorts. Oh, what's, why is that so? This dark coloured cloth, it was new cloth, well it is new cloth. I've had it for a long time. 
I think how long. I think I've had it longer than I've had Joey, so 20 plus years. Or maybe Joey was little. Anyway, I got it in Amsterdam from a shop called um, Den Haan and Wagenmakers. Machtelt, don't laugh at my pronunciation. She wouldn't. You wouldn't laugh at me, would you, Machtelt? Machtelt has a channel called Daily Dose of Paper and she also does stitching sometimes. Um, but she's a Dutch, a Dutch woman. Um, yeah, they had, they had or have a shop in Amsterdam. I'm not sure if it's still there. And they do reproduction Dutch chintz. But it's that very high thread count, you know, that a lot of people like. But I had this little bit. So, <clears throat> I thought I'd use it. Right, I did one extra stitch. I'm just going to... Just go through there somewhere. Isn't it funny how some people like that and think it's lovely and crisp and beautiful high thread count cloth and some of us like really old soft low thread count cloth each to their own so I just got to sew up all the other little sides but I thought for this since I probably won't do fancy stitching on the hexagons themselves well, I'm not pulled through. Um, I might do some in the middle, I'll see. But I thought since, you know, since I wouldn't be doing a lot of slow stitchy type stitching, fancy stitching over it, then it was a good place to use it. Try again. Hide your tail. Go in. I suppose I could be hiding my tail on the back because I'm going to stitch it down anyway. In some places, I think it's where the print is. It's really hard to get my needle through. I lift my elbows up on so I don't wobble the table with the effort. Also, this is quite a thick needle. I don't know why I'm using this. Oh, I think my favourite number nine is tucked in, is, is in a piece of work that's over the back of the sofa that I'm stitching on at the moment. I must have other number nine needles, but I tend to only have one out of each of my tulips, my different sizes. I think I've been using that not particular number nine that's got a bend in it for I don't know how many years. I just find if I just have the one needle that then I look after it. Let's take an extra stitch there, and um, I'm just going to dive through to the back. I should have been doing that all along, it's much easier. And while I'm here on the back, I'll show you. Do you see my stitching on the back is much less visible? So, if you wanted, you know, if you wanted your stitching to be less visible, just do hold them right sides together. and make a knot. I have practiced doing I know there was some discussion about the strange way that I make knots early on people were telling showing me how to do a one-handed knot and how to um, do a quilter's knot and you know I, I kind of know the theory of all those ways but I've just always done it this way and I'm quite happy doing it this way And it's not that I'm saying that, you know, just because you've always done something a certain way doesn't mean you should stick to that way, but if you're happy doing it that way, then carry on doing, carry on doing it that way. I'm not very happy about this cloth being so hard to get my needle through. 
but I shall persevere. Apparently I'm going to have a look in my needle cushion and see, oh there is one there. Oh there it is, there's my number nine. There's my, look, look up, I'm showing you a bent needle. <laughs> there's my bent number nine. I have got it, so do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get that off. And I'm going to thread this on and it will go much easier because it's finer. Hopefully, we'll see, won't we? Look at that. No, not really. <laughs> no, it's just that cloth. That cloth is just like that. slightly easier. Now well, the sun's come out again but it's moved around. I hope it's not making weird shadows. So this uh, Saturday I'm going to um, Elminster Art Centre. I've mentioned it before but I'll mention it again because this will be, um, well there'll be the journaling video on Friday but this will be the last sort of you know regular video before I'm there. I'm going to Elminster Arts Centre on Saturday that'll be the 16th of November if you're watching this later so it'll be gone probably uh, because there's an exhibition of my friend Maria's work opening there um, and I shared her work in, an, in it's the same work I believe and then she had an exhibition in Newbury in Berkshire earlier in the year and I did a little video which is on here. Um, and I'm hoping on Saturday to be able to do another video because it's Ilminster Art Centre and that was, I used to live in Ilminster and that's where I taught um, many workshops but especially my, my monthly slow stitch group was, was there. So I'm meeting, oh, my knot pulled through again, let's do a back stitch. I'm meeting um, some friends there, so we can have a look at Maria's work and see Maria. And um, probably have a nice lunch, there's a lovely cafe there. So if anyone wants to um, go there on Saturday and see Maria's lovely work, it's on for a while. I'll put a link down below to the Ilminster Art Centre website. I'll try and remember. If I forget, the Ilminster Art Centre website is themeetinghouse.org, I believe. But if you just Google Ilminster Art Centre, you'll find it. And then go to exhibitions and it'll tell you how long it's on for. But I'm very much looking forward to going. I haven't been since... Um, and I went in May, I think. I think I went for a, in May just for a cup of tea and a scone. They're world famous for their scones. You've probably heard of them wherever you are in the world. <laughs> their cheese scones. They do fruit scones as well, but I think it's their cheese scones in particular that they're famous for. You have to tell me if you've heard of them. <laughs> This, I wished I hadn't used this cotton, but anyway, I thought it would be okay. It's, I really don't like sewing things that aren't nice to sew, which seems like an obvious thing to say, but I do hear and see people just thinking it's something you have to put up with. And I don't think it is. I think this cloth is going to become maybe a lining of a bag or something because I've got a not I haven't got yards of it I've got a piece that's about maybe a quarter of a yard slightly less when you're doing something for pleasure you don't want to be fighting with your materials 
no offence to um, Den Haan and Wagenmakers of course, people working by machine will love it. And it is lovely cloth, with the pattern and the, the prints and the patterns are beautiful. Just wish they'd do it on, <laughs> on a cheaper cotton. <laughs> And of course, when you buy it, it's all pristine and sized and crisp. And um, I have put it through the, the washing machine. I just threw it in with a normal load of laundry. But it's still... I'll stop complaining, Catherine, about the lovely cloth. I think as well that's why my knot's pulling through. Because it... The hole doesn't close up again like it does on a soft cloth, I don't know. Right, two more sides to do. And of course I could go and find a thimble. I do have a thimble. Just don't like wearing thimbles. That's just me. I'm not saying everybody has to not wear thimbles because I don't like them. I know some people like wearing thimbles and feel not fully dressed without one. That's absolutely fine. You do you. When I used to do proper hand quilting, I didn't wear a thimble either. Although I did try, and I even almost bought one, but um, with a, a hole where your nail goes through. You know, so it wasn't a closed cap. It was supposed to be a more ergonomic thimble. And I've tried um, Sashko thimbles, but with these short needles that I use, they're not really the right thing. And I've even tried little pads that stick on your finger. Well, they were just super annoying. <laughs> for me. For me. It's only for me. So I'd rather just not use a thimble. I'm going to need another bit of thread. For my one more side. So I'm going to do this side and then with the same thread I can carry on and applique it down to the background. I do like it. I do like. I did wonder if that orange was a bit, you know, similar in tone, but I do like it. So that's the look I was going for—a more um, blendy look rather than contrasty look. I'm back to hiding my tail in the fold, apparently. Go in and stay in. And the threads of the fridge has stopped again. I don't mind the sound of the fridge. Some, um, I wonder how you are about things, you know, the some sort of mechanical noises can get on your nerves a bit, can't they? Or is it just me? And others don't. It must be to do with the pitch and the frequency and I don't know what else. So I know in France we had this, in French it's called a VMC. This stands for ventilation something something, central, ventilation mechanique central, something like that. Anyway, it's a central thing that um, ventilates <laughs> mechanically. <laughs> but it was on a timer and so it would come on in the morning and be going on all day and then there were outlets in the um, shower room and loo and... So I don't think there was one in the kitchen. 
but the noise of that was when it first came on until you managed to tune it out it just could get to you in a way that then when it switched itself off at whatever time in the evening it was um, it was like oh phew, thank goodness that stopped do you know what I mean There's no I can hear, but I don't know if you can. I, the very distant sound of someone cutting their grass, and that's kind of companionable. Not having a knot in my throat is not. <coughs> I'm going to have to go and cut my grass. Did I say that already? Not that it takes long. Right, down to the edge, and leave that attached, and um, decide which way up I want, because hexagons can either be, you know, with the, the flat edge, top and bottom, or with the flat edges at the sides, you see what I mean? I think I like it at the flat edge, top and bottom. So I'm thinking this nice fluffy edge here will be the bottom. I'm going to, I'm going to put this in my journal, my little wonky Wednesday journal. And so I'm just going to line it up somewhat centrally by eye. And I'm going to put some applique pins, probably just in this middle one. And then to, if you don't know how to applique, it's basically a similar stitch. So you just go into your background cloth and then move along a bit, eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or somewhere in between. And then take a tiny bite out of whatever it is you're appliquing. And actually this Dutch chintz is not as hard to stitch through. It must have been something to do with how I was holding it or the combination with that and the other cloth. It's still not, you know, she said dropping a needle. It's still not as lovely to stitch through as the background is with the old bit of flannel sheet and the sock noil. Oh, now I've said that it's becoming harder again. Oh well, I've only got to go round three of them the other three will be okay because that finer cotton okay i turned the camera off for the appliqueing because i was wobbling the table enormously with the effort of getting it through that dutch chintz so yeah i would really recommend because of all the folds that you choose some really fine soft cotton cloth um so i want to do some fancy stitching and i've gone and got my handy dandy circle template because i feel like drawing a little circle in the middle to kind of because everywhere else has got buttons um, try and line it up somewhat, maybe a slightly bigger one. This is handy because it's got these little lines on it. And if it's important to you that it's central, I'm going to draw a faintish line. And then I've, excuse my arm, sorry, that was rude, reaching across. I, th I think that's from, um, I do hear other YouTube creators saying excuse their arms when they're reaching. But um, my auntie Audrey, who I've mentioned before, who is a real stickler for table manners, if you reached across at the table for the salt or whatever, you know, even if it was sort of there and you went like that, she that wasn't allowed. You had to get it with this hand so you didn't cross your plate. <laughs> she was lovely, my auntie Audrey. She was not remotely a dragon or anything like that. She just had something for table manners. So I'm going to go and stitch around my little circle. I've got this, um, this is some of the silk that I dyed when I did the onion skin dyeing video ages ago. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's in the tutorials playlist. It's called Natural Dyeing and Eco Printing with Onion Skins or something catchy like that. 
Um, so I'm just going to stitch round my circle that I just drew. See this lovely soft red cloth is nice to stitch through even though it's all those layers. But if if things are too thick, you can just you don't your fancy stitching doesn't have to go all the way through to the back everywhere. You can just stitch into the the top few layers. I'm just going to do a running stitch round and then see what I do further. See how it looks. I'm having done the canther on the Nakshi canther on Monday. I did think about doing a spiral in here, but then I thought better of it. <laughs> I love those spirals. I think I will start using them again more. There's a, a large quilt of mine that was in. Um, my group CQS exhibition, not this one just gone, but the previous one called Everything's Connected to Everything Else. My friend's got it now. A friend of mine had it, has uh, got it. Um, but on there I did a lot of the spiral stitching and step running stitch and there was a lot of canther inspired stitching on that. And now when I'm getting to the end, just need to judge a bit, stitch, space, stitch. Can I squeeze in? I haven't judged very well because I wasn't paying attention anyway. Yeah, and um, I think I did so much canther inspired embroidery on that and so much heavy embroidery that then you kind of, sometimes you do a lot of something, don't you? And then you want to have a change. And then at one point you go back to it. I think I might be ready to go back to it. Um, I quite like the simplicity of that, just like that. My initial plan was to then do seed stitch or something in the middle, but I just think that is just all it needs. So I'm going to end off, but then I'm going to outline stitch the hexagon with this same thread. I think I'm just going to do, I'm going to start by doing a line of running stitch just around the whole of the outside, about an eighth of an inch away. and then see how it looks. Now when you start, when you become aware of Cantha and you start looking, you see it everywhere. It's inspired so many people. I've mentioned Jude Hill and Miriam Heelan and you know there's many people. Ecta Call herself who wrote the book that I showed you that many of you have now got or got from the library or whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be faithful copies of the original. Things can just inspire your own work, you know, in, in, in other ways. Or just elements of, of things. Or just a style or whatever. And that's what's so wonderful these days with the internet. That, the, that we have access to all of these things that before we wouldn't, you know, unless we were lucky enough to go and travel in all these different places. You know, Japanese borrow and... Um, all the Indian embroidery techniques and you know all, all all cultures have textile techniques don't they including our own um, I do want to talk about a couple of other British um, British quilting and stitching techniques at one point they will be coming Did, um, did. I don't like saying I did a thing. I did, you know, I did English paper piecing. I talked, about, I don't know why, I talked about English paper piecing I, and I talked about crazy quilting, which was big in the Victorian times. Um, but, um, yeah, like I said, there's a couple of other, a couple of others coming up. But it, I think it's nice to learn about these things. And my my way of doing it is to learn about the things, explore the canther, for example, then ex explore the stitches. This is why I did it with you that way, if you're following with the Monday project. Explore the stitches that are used. 
learn a little bit about the history, um, then look at how they're traditionally made, and then have a go at making something, just something small, um, you know, close to the, the source, similar, it's always inspired by of course, but and then from there looking at how you can take the elements of that, that that you like, that speak to you and include those in your own work. And that's, a kind of, that's the kind of process I go on when I discover something new. I mean Kawendi for example, the, um, it's also Indian but it's African people that were that were taken or migrated to India, that that way of working. Um, if you went here for Kawendi, which was again uh, quite early on in the Slow Stitch Mondays, wasn't it? That's quite, <coughs> excuse me, um, that's quite unique in um, patchwork and quilting in that you start at the outside and work your way in. But there are always elements of these things that you can take and and translate into, you know, other, other work that you do. I mean, this outline stitching that I always like to do of things, it's, you, you think about um, quilting, you know, when you quilt patchwork. Patchwork and quilting are um, often bracketed together these days, but it, was ne it wasn't always like that. They were once seen as two completely separate entities. Quilting was done on whole cloth quilts. So just one piece of cloth and patchwork was not quilted. Um, so if you think about it, quilting patchwork is quite tricky because of all the seams. And one common way of hand quilting patchwork or machine quilting patchwork is to not is, well, one, one way is to go in the seam, and that's called stitching in the ditch. And um, another way is to outline quilt or shadow quilt, so you quilt a quarter of an inch or so away from the seam. But this out, so this outlining kind of references that, but also, of course, it references that canther four stitch that you do that I talked about on Monday when you've done your embroidery to, to quilt the ground, to hold all the layers together in, in the, the ground of the, the piece, you know, the background. And that's obviously because that has a practical function that crosses cultures, that when you put layers of cloth together you need to stitch them, you know, you need stitches um, a certain distance apart to hold it all together, don't you? If you leave big areas unstitched, the layers won't be held. Um, but also, inevitably, when humans perform creative tasks, even if those tasks are with something functional in mind, like a cover to keep you warm in bed, often um, creativity comes comes through and, you know, you go further than what's needed for the um, you know, the technicality, if you see what I mean. And then you start getting creative with it and that's how things evolve and, you know, it's just, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? That doesn't mean that we now, uh, you could say, you could look at the world and think everything's been thought of that can be thought of, but even if you don't come up with something completely new, um, and that's maybe getting more and more difficult because of the way things are shared these days. Um, it doesn't matter because you you doing it, it's the first time you've done it. So, you know, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? So it's unique because it's you doing it. You could say it's never been done by you. So that makes it new. Okie dokie. So, is that enough to attach it to my page? Otherwise I use another thread. I want to 
there we go so I'm gonna I won't sew it in my journal with you but did I have anything to show you from last time I can't remember to be honest because I need to take a photo of it and I need to take it somewhere where there's better light for the photo um, Oh, it was that last week. Did I show you me stitching that in? The um, stringy quilt that Alexandra, Alishandra, sorry Alishandra, um, Alishandra suggested. So this will be going on that page. Wouldn't that make a great rice bag though? <laughs> Were you waiting? Were you waiting for me to say it? Did you think I wasn't gonna? Actually it's slightly too big for my page but it'll stick out, that'll be fine. And I said I wanted the fluffy edge at the bottom. Maybe, maybe baby I have the fluffy edge sticking out. So I will have it that way around. But anyway, I shall go and photograph it and then I'll stitch it in there. So I hope you like that for a new technique, which I showed you in the first, you know, five or ten minutes and the rest you didn't have to watch unless you wanted to. Um, and thank you so much again, Trudy. I think it's lovely. And um, I hope you all enjoy having a go at it. And as always, thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Bye bye.